Thanks especially to you, Ambassador, for coming from Tokyo and uh, joining us at the Asia Society. Thanks you are among friends here, and we're really very much looking forward to getting a sense from you about what's going on in Japan, what's happening in the U.S.-Japan relationship, how that is sort of shaping the Indo-Pacific, shaping the global scene. You all just heard Rory run through the ambassador's impressive bio. I'll give you two points, though, of our own intersection. <laughs> when, uh, when the ambassador was chief of staff under Barack Obama, I worked under him as the special assistant to the president for Asia, and we, uh, we had a lot of adventures, including relating to uh, the challenges from North Korea at the time. And uh, secondly, we both attended Sarah Lawrence College. So I think only in uh, Asia Society could you get a foreign policy panel made up exclusively of Sarah Lawrence alumni. It doesn't, the doesn't chances, happen the chances the of that are one out of 10 billion. Yeah. That's right. So you came on exactly the right day. Anyway, um, our program is titled U.S.-Japan Relations in the Biden Era, and you are the personification of that. You, you have been at the heart of U.S.-Japan relations in the Obama era, and we want to hear what it's been like and what's going on. Well, uh, that's kind of a, that's a lot of real estate to cover. And, uh, so here's, I think, the relationship, and it, just to be quick and short, is uh, morphing and transforming from one that was defined by alliance protection to one that's being defined by alliance projection. And it's going in, uh, and Japan is uh, updating a series of things that I think are gonna help in that alliance projection. One of the things I would um, kind of illustrate that point, when we were coming close to the UN vote for March 3rd, conde condemning Russia back in 2022, Japan organized all the ASEAN countries and uh, eight out of the 10 ASEAN countries voted to condemn Russia. Four of them were co-sponsors of the resolution. But that's an illustration of a different, more confident Japan going uh, side by side with us as we project into the region a set of policies. Obviously here, as it goes without saying, the increase in the defense spending the from 1% to 2%, the acquiring of, um, of uh, uh, counter-strike capability, but the uh, thing, and maybe this is the former chief of staff, former senior advisor, he did it, that is the prime minister, two things with A, no protest on the streets of Tokyo. There was no pushback. There was a recognition of the need to step up. And second, and I think this is valuable to note, the prime minister called for the 2% before there was a tank on the Ukrainian border. There's a lot of countries in Europe that have yet to do this. And they passed the budget, and they're proceeding, trust me, proceeding uh, as we just worked out the issue on the counter-strike capability and timing and delivery and uh, capability. But the other piece of this that I would add, that's on the security side. And this is kind of a bone, so let me just get this out. It's more therapy for me. We keep defining deterrence only by a, a national security. You know, in the region, taking what I talk alliance projection, the single most popular country in the region by far, Japan. That kind of popularity, the values kind of seen, is really helpful to the alliance as we deal with the other countries in the region. Second part of deterrence is what happened at Camp David in August. That's deterrence. And then last and finally, you know, I don't, you, this is the economy and the structures of pieces around the economy are fundamentally changing. The stock market is up significantly. There's a big flow of capital coming in from around the world into Japan. I mean, I had a, a series, I mean, just the other day, Larry Fink left uh, Tokyo. He had brought, I think, $22 trillion worth of so sovereign wealth funds to Japan. It was a massive amount. I may have gotten maybe a zero wrong, but that was a lot of money. <laughs> flowing around, but the uh, Qatari Sovereign Wealth Fund, the UAE Sovereign Wealth Fund, Australia, they were all present, and it was a dinner with the Prime Minister and the head of May. But there's a re-evaluation, and they're making changes that are fundamental to their economy as well. Um, I just, just a story the other day, 
in the FT about mergers and acquisitions taking off in Japan and being a little more kind of strategic than that. That's just a, me a measure of one piece. So on every almost level, I think there's a kind of what I call a um, alliance projection and a modernization and reforming that's necessary for the future. Well, wow, you, you're almost giving a plug for the Meiji Modern Exhibition upstairs because- it, uh, I'm, a, I'm a paid consultant <laughs> to it, so I should have. You're, you're describing a pretty dramatic and a pretty fundamental uh, transformation. And I, I like the, the model, the image of uh, alliance protection to alliance projection. And as you point out, there's a diplomatic, uh, cultural, and economic component to the, to the projection that benefits the United States. Well, I want to come back to all of those substantive issues, but before I do, can I just ask a little bit about what the experience This is your is? interview, so you could do whatever you want. I mean, I, I may not answer it, but you could do whatever you want. Well, I'm hoping it's a conversation, okay. not an interview. But what's it been like for you? What's your uh -oh. own personal experience been in, in Japan? What's I am totally, I mean, you know, I am, well, first of all, I, didn't, I was there as mayor. I didn't really have kind of a benchmark to measure again. I'm totally, in love with it. I, my joke is I came, I saw, and I fell in love. But I'll give you, um, I mean, just some uh, kind of po touch points to kind of say this. Well, the thing that has most touched me and I find the most beautiful thing, stunningly beautiful, isn't Mount Fuji, which I've climbed. Is, you know, as a former mayor of the city of Chicago, which is true for any big city, any part of the city, and. I think we all know this in America. I mean, I created safe passage routes so kids could walk to school eight blocks, free of fear. And in Tokyo, you have five-year-old kids, you know, this size, in school uniforms, baseball caps, or other hats, backpacks twice their size. And they just walk eight blocks to school, six blocks to school. Not a parents let them out, not a worry in the world. They come up to a busy street, they put their hand up like this, and they just cross. Cars come to a stop. They have their childhood. And if you come from America, and you came as a mayor of Chicago, the, the thing kind of ripped my soul apart as mayor, watching, being at hospitals or homes. It's one of the most beautiful things in the world. A child. And you know, the other thing I notice is, you know, parents walk, and about 20 feet back is their child following them. They never turn around and look. They're not worried about them getting snatched, something happening to them. And I, you know, first time, like, you know, the mother's walking down, and I'm like, holding, want to hold a kid's hand to make sure they get down. And, uh, you know, and I was like, you know, going kind of Jewish mother kid, and I was like helicoptering around them. But it's really such a safe society. And it manifests itself in different ways. And I keep saying to the Japanese audience, this is normal to you. You don't see it. But you come from America. It's stark. Children. I mean, the other thing is, like, if you get on a train in Japan, a child, and you put your passport card, parents get a text. Child got on the train, got through the turnstile. It's just incredibly this sense of community, this sense of society, the sense of value of an individual in that, it's stunning. So that's one. The other thing is I've noticed here, you know, obviously as we live through COVID, but you know, we can't get anybody to the office at 11 a.m. They can't get anybody out of the office until 11 p.m. Uh, I mean, I, I, when I go home, when I'm after dinner, I walk home and people are coming out of the offices at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, women are working out, men are working out, just going to the train. I mean, it's like the, the sense of dedication and professionalism is incredible. I mean, I've taken the trains everywhere, I always did, but that's, all, I mean, the entire, <laughs> I used to, when I took a train as mayor of the city of Chicago, I always did, but this is also true in New York, it's true everywhere. I'm gonna take the Amtrak to DC today. Okay, I used to build 15, 20 minutes in for delays. The Schenkensen entire delay for all of last year, the whole system, was three and a half minutes. 
That's like a brown line from you know one stop to the next. Three and a half minutes. I mean, it's, so there's certain things that are just enchanting. And I've done some bike rides around and love it. And I just, I think it's a beautiful country. Beautiful, the people are contrary to images of, they are reserved, but they, when you know them, incredibly warm and receptive. So I, mean, I could go on, I could do the whole thing about this and other things that I've fallen in love with in the country. And, and here's the other thing, here you're in New York, they have 37 million people in Tokyo. You guys got eight. There's zero traffic in Japan, okay? <laughs> you can't go black here for an hour, okay? It's just unbelievable. Uh, so I, there's just things that strike you. And so I am totally uh, uh, in love with the country, all, all right. over the country. Well, your mission to instill uh, Tokyo envy, Japan envy, and the New York audience has been a complete success. Well, I will... Uh, Especially the part about being able to cross the street without getting hit by a messenger on a I bicycle. Have, it's, uh, well, that's for the adults. I'm, my thing is just the beauty of watching a child walk to school without any fear, and the whole society knows their responsibility to that child, not by name, but by obligation and responsibility to the community. It's, and a parent has the confidence to do that. It's really beautiful. Well, that's very moving. More broadly, I mean, you described this on the social uh, level, but more broadly, geopolitically, internationally, when I served as assistant secretary, I found myself always trying to explain to people within the US government that when you look at Asia, Japan is arguably the most undervalued asset we have, mm -hmm. the most sort of underappreciated partner. Now, that has perhaps changed as part of this projection yeah. and transformation, but what's, what's the case that you make about why Japan as a nation is so important to the U.S. in foreign policy, well, economic, and security? Well, one is, I mean, first and foremost, it's in one of the most important regions of the world. Second, unlike our relationship over the last 20, 30 years, we basically, well, there were different countries, different stuff. We have a mind meld strategically. You don't have any kind of salt or sand in the gears that, from economics or other things that kind of disrupt it. Third, we have a partner in Japan that's extremely popular in the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. That has value to it. S second, or fourth, or I don't know which number I'm on at this point, is the third largest economy in the world. Really valuable and plays by the same set of rules. It's a country with a great education system, highly educated workforce, great universities. You also have uh, a rule of law third largest economy. And then I would say uh, the one thing I want to add, other people see it as an more important, it's a very important region of the world, respected in the region. This is my, a country that is used to scarcity. Energy from the 70s, you know about post Fukushima. Here's the one thing Ch uh, Japan has in massive abundance that the rest of the world is struggling with. Water. Yeah. They've never had a drought. Australia has a drought. We have a drought. We can't get grain down the Mississippi. Europe has a drought. China has a drought. And so across the globe, Mideast has massive droughts. Africa. Japan has a massive abundance of fresh water. And every day going forward, that's going to play a more and more important role. And so Japan has a very important role to play with us. Um, they have an important role in the region. They're a trusted arbiter in the region. I forgot the numbers, and I'm doing this by memory so I can have it wrong, but I think in the Singapore poll and the Pew poll in the region, their numbers are in the uh, low 60s in a sense of favorability. And that counts for something when you're an interlocker with other governments. And so that's an important ally. Well, you mentioned water, and I... Agree, that's an important and a little-known uh, asset. 
Another asset of Japan, obviously, is, is talent. You right. mentioned the tremendous education, the work ethic, and so on. But if you set aside water and talent, Japan is a country that's pretty bereft of natural resources. It doesn't, has to import energy, it has to import food. Right. It's really, really dependent on the rest of the world for natural resources and imports. And on top of that, it's a huge exporter, huge manufacturing hub. Mm -hmm. So supply chains and economic security kind of go to the heart of Japan's survival mm -hmm. and viability. What have you seen over the time that you've been there in terms of progress or focus on, on economic security in Japan? Well, one is they passed a CFIUS law. I mean, a lot of in the last year, as it relates to economic... CFIUS being yeah, a, right, economic, a screening of... Screening of investments or acquisitions into the country, which are really, really important. They've made major strides in the supply chain. Now, one of the things I describe on their semiconductors is Japan is the supply chain of the supply chain. They have 18 companies that have anywhere to 40% or greater market share in their space. And we all talk about ASML. Tokyo Electron is a major, major player in the machinery piece of the semiconductor. But there's other companies like that. And TSMC in Taiwan building two plants right now. Micron is doing a major expansion of a plant in that area. Uh, on the memory side. Um, so they have done a lot there. But I'll give you one thing that also has caught my attention. And this gives an acknowledgement. Japan was ahead of the rest of the world in loss of you know, population. Korea's there. China's there. You can see it in Europe. What's the one sector that dominant in that you're going to need in a shrinking population? Robotics. Five of the I think, I'm doing this in my memory, I think four or five of the top 10 companies in robotics, all Japanese. Very, very important. I mean, now it comes out of how do you deal with a worker shortage, but they made it using their engineering and their uh, manufacturing base, and they've made it an, from a liability to at least a strength, some kind of a strength. So those are kind of indications to me of where Japan can play an important role, where they have some dominance in there. As you said, they have scarcity in their background, but they also have bring an engineering and work ethic and a capacity that's pretty unparalleled. That's true. I, I have been struck uh, over the years at not only has Japan, as you said, led in, uh, in silver, in, mm -hmm. in the grain society, but led uh, and in robotics and in health-related uh, products, mm -hmm. but also in universal design, uh, yeah. in, in building homes and even 7-Eleven uh, convenience stores <laughs> that have aisles that are wide enough for yeah. a wheelchair or placement that is suitable for older people. And in that kind of ironic sense, they're, they're really blazing a trail. Now, I don't know how successful they are in sort of propagating uh, those kinds of initiatives. Well, that's but actually, they're setting a good example. I was not there before, so I can't speak to this. But people, have, enough people have said it with some frequency that you know, it is an island, and it's both physically and psychologically an island. On the other end, businesses there, while some were global, were ha kind of content in the Japanese market. They are clearly opening up now, and in this phase of opening up, not only inviting the world in, but pushing out and the, and their kind of Japanese uh, brand and companies in specific areas, and you can see that, and with a new level of confidence. So that's a pretty consistent theme in the various things you're describing: this opening up, right. this pushing out, this projection. On the security side, what are and the diplomatic side? What are some of the drivers? What's, what's behind that? How much of it is changes within Japan? How much of it is responding to uh, exogenous global events? Yes, yes, and yes. I mean, look, it's a, it's a rough neighborhood. You got China, North Korea, Russia's wanting to play a bigger role uh, as a sidekick to both those countries. Mm -hmm. And so it's definitely changed uh, their perspective that they have to, in many ways, 
the brethren just have be a partner to the United States, and I don't mean to say this, but historically in a kind of more junior position, compare pursue equal standing shoulder to shoulder, and we need to welcome it, and we are welcoming it, but we also got to make sure that we update the way we think about it as Japan as a partner. There's some obligations to us to do that, and I think that that, um, I think Japan knows that they, um, and, I, and again, I hark to this because I think it says something. Before there was a tank on the Ukrainian border, the prime minister called for uh, increasing their defense spending to 2% of GDP before that tank ever appeared. And you're, many European countries have yet to do it. They not only did it, not only passed it, they're already on the process of implementing it and executing that five-year plan. And their strategic three national security documents that they redid are so complementary to ours, and ours are so complementary to Japan. So I think there's a lot of things that they saw changing and realized doing the same old, same old with changed circumstances wasn't going to measure up. So on the alliance front, um, you mentioned, you touched on strike capability. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned the increased budget. But what really is changing in the U.S.-Japan alliance? Well, I'm not sure. I, uh, look, I, one thing, I mean, just take Camp, I mean, I, this did not get, I don't, I, I think I read a lot about Camp David was a significant, the uh, president bringing Japan and the ROK together was a seismic shift in the plates in the Indian Pacific. Now, um, it fundamentally, now you gotta build on it. There's gonna be some activities, there already was between the defense secretaries, but other type of things that will happen that build on the momentum coming out of Camp David that you know, one of the premises that China had was that United States, Japan, and Korea could never get on the same page. That's happened. We're doing it in the defense side. We're doing it working through a lot of issues on the semiconductor side. That has massive implications beyond the geographies of the three countries into the Indo-Pacific, into the area. And that's, and Japan is a link pin in that trilateral. They're a, an essential player in the quad. So. They're also an essential player, as I told you about their kind of popularity in the region. They're a big player with the Philippines. They're the number one investor in the Philippines is Japan. And so that's a major player when you think about what's going on in the South China Sea, to have them as that partner. And to be honest, we have to, as a country, we wanted this all along, but we have some, we as a country, strategically, Defense-wise, economically, we have to think anew and kind of modernize the way we approach Japan and the region as well. Well, I think the Camp David Accord is an incredible accomplishment, and that's also that's a milestone in rethinking yeah. uh, our relationship uh, with Japan and what it what the U.S.-Japan alliance and what the U.S. ROK alliance mm -hmm. really needs to be. So it's uh, a step towards a new level of integration. But it's got to be complicated in Japan. Japan has this pacifist uh, constitution, a tradition of shying away from uh, military. For a long time, they wouldn't call their military the military. Self-defense force. Right. Um, so what kind of debate is there in Japan about this projection about this transformation? Well, there's a, there's a, like any democracy, a healthy debate. Let me do one. This is the old kind of chief of staff and me. But one of the things that it took me a while to get my head around, in our country, our older voters are more hawkish than our younger voters. I think we saw that. Uh, and our younger voters on issues of climate change, equity, et cetera, those are the things that animate them. And I'm not saying in Japan, equity issues clearly on gender, income don't animate, but the older voters in Japan are more dovish and the younger voters are the more hawkish. And I'm using that generically, I wanna be careful, you know. They care about all the other issues that their peers across the globe do in a developed economy. But the fact is, 
they have a big voice and play a big role on the national security issue and what drove that. In many ways also, to be honest, there was a poll recently that was out in um, Japan about the prime minister's overture to the ROK and where did it do best with? Younger people. So they're not totally captured by the past. And so I think, that's, uh, I think that means the future, at least on alignment on certain things, is gonna be easier for us. Well, that's huge. Now, coming back to energy. Um, oh, I was waiting for you to do that so I could address this. <laughs> you mentioned Japan's uh, uh, wealth in water, and that's important, and hydropower is important. You mentioned Japan's technology and uh, engineering and innovation. Renewables are mm -hmm. an important part of that. What about nuclear power? I lived through in the NFC, yeah. as you remember, the 311 Fukushima, yeah, yeah. Fukushima. We've just had this um, brouhaha about uh, the release of uh, tritium. But setting that aside, well, talk I don't, a little I, bit. I, I, want to, I want to address that. I'm sure you do. Yeah, I got I to get this. Well, let me, first of all, look, uh, I'm just the energy. Uh, well, let me do it this way. Ten years, you know, a decade ago, 2011, a little uh, tw a dozen years, a horrible incident happened. Three years ago, a horrible incident happened in Wuhan, China, COVID. Now, Japan, after 10 years, has been fully transparent, invited the international community in, and based it on science, what I call the Japan Protocols. China, you don't know anything about COVID. They did not invite the world in. They did not invite the World Health Organizations. They still resist information. Now, breaking news, something's gonna happen somewhere in the world of horrific consequences somewhere in the next five years. I'm gonna go out on a limb. It's gonna happen. Now, do you want that country to follow China's protocols or Japan's protocols? And they're continuing to monitor it. And, in, you know, I, my view is this is an example of you either are going to have a country be a responsible international player in the international system that upholds certain principles like transparency, science, and accountability. Or you're going to basically accept the fact that countries can deceive everybody else, especially when it's a world health crisis that affects every other country. And I say this not just from a kind of scientific basis. You know, all of us in the last three years were learning from other countries what was working, what wasn't, wasn't working, and adjusting our policies. Well, you'd like another country, especially where the disease started, to be a little more transparent and participatory on a scientific, medically-based process. And I, you know, really think this is an important moment because we have two different modus operandi and models. And I'm hoping, God forbid, when something bad happens in the world, a natural disaster that has huge consequences or has some public health crisis, that that country has the fortitude to follow the same protocols Japan does. We're, we're a better international system when you participate like that with science or medicine, transparent and fully uh, accountable for what happens. Thank you very much for that therapy. I needed to get that off my chest. Uh, second is, on the. let me go through the energy pieces Again, because again, I think it's important to think slightly different. Mm -hmm. We talked about, I talked about water. What's the uh, energy, another uh, place you can't do fusion without water? Japan has been 20 years ahead of the rest of the world on fusion research. We just let out our first set of grants just the other day, I think it was seven to eight billion dollars in the United States to look at the fusion research. Not that we weren't doing it before, but this is the first real big bulk statement by the United States. Japan has been on top of fusion for 20 years and a head start on that research. They have, after the Fukushima, they shut down their nuclear facilities. They're up to 12 now, working through the issues. I think they set a goal, the prime minister did, of 17 to 20 to get up and running again over the next year or so. And that will be a significant piece of their energy and it's climate sensitive energy there. Three companies with the greatest quantity of uh, 
patents in battery, all three, top three, are Japanese in the battery space. So they have a capacity there in a big place there, not just for cars, but for just battery storage, et cetera, that whole space. Geothermal, now they gotta work through some local issues, but there are huge, huge potential in Japan on the geothermal space. Um, and obviously the coastline, if they can work out the engineering on floating wind, is also a huge opportunity in Hokkaido, throughout, but also throughout the whole country, um, and also solar area. So they have a lot that they can do in the energy space where they have been uh, leaders in that area. In this nuclear area, beyond the big plants, where they have 56, we have four SMRs, small modular nuclears, small medium-sized reactors, they're called. TerraPower, which is by Gates. There's a new scale that came out of the Idaho laboratory. There's two other um, companies. In the first two, Japan's the financers of those plants. And I, I, to get from here to there on energy, economies, climate, SMR nuclears are going to have to play a very, very important role. And you're going to have to, and Japan with the United States has been a real partner in making that. We're testing one right now in Romania, one in the, two different ones in the United States. Um, Ghana's looking at it. Philippines is looking at it. Some other countries, okay. I think that's a real promising technology for attacking both energy and climate change. So tacking back to the more political side, you talked a bit about uh, your perceptions, American perceptions of Japan and what is and needs to change and why. Um, what about Japanese perceptions of the United States. When I talk to friends, former counterparts throughout Asia, one of the recurring themes is America is looking pretty good, pretty strong, but how long is this going to last? Uh, what about the uh, 180s that you've done in the past at a presidential election, and what we don't know what's going to happen there's a sense of uncertainty and um, arguably a, a lack of confidence in the United States in some countries. Where does Japan fit in that anxiety meter? Well, I mean, look, I mean, I think every, we have our, you know, as Americans, we're looking at the election with the level. Uh, so look, they have made, they're in on America. And I will say this, let me, before I get to Japanese interpretations of America or view of America, I mean, I've been in politics my whole, public service, politics my whole life. It is interesting when you get 8,000 miles away in 11 hours of time difference and you look back and go, I mean, Washington sometimes looks like Disneyland on the Potomac. I mean, it's really, I mean, it's, you get kind of that distance and it, I mean, I was there and, I thought it was crazy then, but you walk, you get 8,000 miles away, it, it really gets into focus pretty good. It doesn't get blurry, it gets focused. So, I mean, and kind of exemplified right now by the, I mean, by way of example, it's a different position, so I wanna be clear. Japan just announced who their speaker is gonna be because their other speaker got sick. We don't have a speaker. I mean, in case that's breaking news to anybody, and they, we can't figure out how to get a speaker, and it's in the Constitution. Uh, so, to me, uh, you know, it's uh, that's just to draw a fine line of the differences there. But they're, they look at the United States, and there's things that they like every, that they admire and love, and the size of the country, the education system, the kind of entrepreneurial culture that exists here, and how universities are part of that entrepreneurial culture how we take a research at both companies and universities and start things up in the kind of uh, uh, cap capacity. So there's a lot of things they admire. I think they look at our politics and they, uh, and they wanna make sure that the America they know is the America that's gonna be there tomorrow. One other observation that uh, struck me, and when you look at the business, and it's, well, this goes back to your first question, we have a fund-driven capitalism. Private equity funds, hedge funds, venture funds, mutual funds. 
they have an institutional driven capitalism, banks, insurance companies, pension funds. It's now both have positives and both have negatives. Mm -hmm. But one has a risk appetite, the other one doesn't. Mm -hmm. Now, both of them have excesses that are not good and both have some other qualities that are for me. But it, it took me a while to get my head around uh, the fact is that the funding mechanisms for the economic systems are kind of really different. Yeah. Not that we don't have banks and insurance companies and not that they don't have private equity and hedge funds, but they play different roles in the economy. And there's some history behind that too. Mm -hmm. The the great uh, Keiretsus, the great right. uh, Japanese corporations with their intertwined. Uh, well, the trading houses are a whole different type of economic. Is that? Well, but you mentioned the work ethic and you mentioned right. some of the generational right. uh, divides and phenomenon in terms of politics and attitudes. But my sense is that there is less appeal among younger people to entering into those institutions, the allure of lifetime employment, being a well, cog in the wheel and so on. Is, it, is the society changing in that respect? Yes, it's it's. It's totally changing. You look at kids from Tokyo U that are going now into entrepreneurship and startups that is different than it was just 10 years ago. Here's my one kind of bigger takeaway. And there's a lot of Japan experts. They're very smart. Um, a lot of the precepts I was guided on before I went there, it's just not true anymore. I'm not saying it's n not it's false, mm -hmm. but Japan is a different country and is evolving in a much different way. And you can look at things like the defense spending, like what was done at Camp David, and what's happening in the economy and the funding of the economy, and you can catch it. Uh, but um, everybody was telling me beforehand, oh, it's the pace of the country is different, et cetera. And I have found they've moved with deliberate speed at least on the security side and the economic side. Um, and so I think we as Americans, are what I would say, need to update, and especially those who are quote unquote Japan hands, have to update the way they understand the country because it's a different country than it was 20 years ago as we are. All right, well, as a former uh, professional Japan hand, point yeah. taken. Yeah. Um, well, don't get guilty about it, I'm just telling you, you know what I mean? You know. <laughs> I mean, in wow, terms, that was kind of in terms of update. Um, you would agree it's a, it, ten years ago versus now. Oh, I think the shifts, uh, the changes in Japan have been dramatic. And okay, there. Normal. That's no all. We, we can it. agree on that. No, okay. qu no question about it. Um, TPP. Um, <laughs> we talked a little bit about economics and the relationship, yeah. but. You know, trade has always been a, uh, a source of, of friction in the U.S.-Japan relationship. I remember <laughs> the, you know, s members of Congress smashing Japanese cars and Toshiba TVs uh -huh. in front of the Capitol way back when. Um, there have been ups and downs, and in fact, I think the movement towards TPP and the Obama administration represented a pretty shiny path forward for the U.S.-Japan trade relationship. We found a lot of workarounds, but what do you hear from the Japanese about TPP and what's the prospect of uh, well, let, the trade relationship changing? Let, well, I have, having spent a lot of time on the issue of international trade economics, look, three C's, and believe in especially with a like-minded country like Japan, et cetera, the value, we're clearly in a different place where we were 30 years ago. I mean, people forget this. Bill Clinton ran for president and was running ads in Michigan and Ohio that were about Japan, and it wasn't in a positive light. And he did that five-pillar trade agreement or trade principles in 1995, I think it was, or 94. Um, so we're in a different space than we were. We're much more simpatico. Not that we don't have friction or issues, but they're not what existed for us 30 years ago. Second, I would say is the world. Look, three C's have changed the world. COVID, conflict, and coercion. 
They've up upended every one of our um, assumptions and perceptions. And the idea that you're going to just snap back to where you were pre-COVID, when you look at supply chains, you look at countries hoarding medical supplies, the idea that after Russia's war and what's happened in the use of energy, not as a resource, but as a strategic asset for leverage, the idea of given what China's done on economic coercion is doing against Japan in real time as we sit here, you're not just snapping back to this other era of just bring back TPP. I do think that you have to understand that those three C's have fundamentally altered the world and that also one of the benefits though for us in, the, in with Japan but also in the region. Obviously there's some, if you go to Latin America, you go to Europe, there's like a resistance to America. This region in Japan specifically but also the region wants all of America, not just part of America economically, militarily, diplomatically, politically. It's a dip because they know an untethered China is a real risk to them. And they need America, all of America, its presence. Now we have to as a country, and there's an attempt with the president with IPEF to adjust to the shift that has happened in this, what I call the post three C's and change that. Now my own view, and this is a longer conversation, that internet, I don't buy this idea you're gonna snap back, and I don't buy this idea that you're just gonna to go to deglobalization. That's not what's happening. I think there's three characteristics that are making up international trade, or what I call economic statecraft. And there may be more, but these are the ones I can identify. Where cost and efficiency used to drive the system, Political stability and economic sustainability are now driving it. You're not going to have a country. You can see what's happening vis-a-vis -vis China. There's no international investors, no capital investment. Political stability, economic sustainability, and people aren't going to do it, and especially in a country where you can get arrested at any at the whim. Second is energy is not a resource, but a strategic asset. And that requires us to think that way. Third, we used to measure things by how much you sold. Today, you measure by how much data you collect. There is no company involved in international, whether it's one company and to one country, no company involved in international trade and makes products and exports them, whether it's financial services, manufacturing, and you know, pharmaceutical, healthcare. They are data companies that make medical devices. They are data companies that make pharmaceutical companies. Data is the major driver. Now to all of us who are like-minded countries with like-minded views, believe in the rule of law, believe in rules versus raw power, getting an understanding and consensus on data is gonna be really important so we don't let other countries who are trying to harm us set the rules for that. Very important asset. But all three of those, political stability and economic sustainability, energy as a strategic asset, and, people, and what I would call data collection versus measuring something by how much you sell versus data collect. Those are the, what I think are the emerging kind of North Stars of economic, international economic statecraft. And that's key for us with Japan. Mm -hmm. And Japan's that partner in every one of those pieces. That's a great, great framework, um, and I love. Well, I thought about it in the pool, so there it is. <laughs> I love the slogan: "The region wants all of America." Well, that just part. I, of it. Let me say this. I'm gonna, my son is in the Navy. He's an intel officer. I don't think we should put the burden. I mean, and I truly believe the people that volunteer in the United States are the true one percent. I don't think you should measure 1% by how much you collect or own. I think you should measure 1% by how much you give and give back. And I think it's a mistake for all of America's strategic interest in the Indo-Pacific to put all of it on these young men and women who I've seen on the Ronald Reagan, the Abraham Lincoln, 
down in our different bases. Why should they be the only ones that bear the responsibility for America's strategic interest? They've signed up, but they're only a piece of it. And we have so much other strengths. It was on display at Camp David. Those two leaders of another world countries came to America because we stood for something, Camp David stood for something, and that political presence changed the region and changed China's calculations. And so to me, as having actually two children in the armed forces, I think it's really incumbent on all of us, especially in the Indo-Pacific, especially if you think China is the pacing power, as we say, then you know what? All of America has to participate in this. And when we put all of America on the field, I'd bet long on America. And it's wrong that the, I, I met this one woman on the Abraham Lincoln. I happened to take Foreign Minister Hayashi on that visit. And her husband and her child were back in the States. And I think I got the frame right, but she hadn't talked to them in six months because of the mission of the Abraham Lincoln. She's dedicated. She signed up. She's holding her end of the bargain. And all of us who are comfortable in this room, are we holding up our side like she is? And I, if you're honest, no. Now, I get it's a difficult issue and et cetera, but that part of the world, and I can say this about Japan, and I've spent some, they want America. And that's a good thing. They want us politically and we're active. They want us diplomatically, we're active. And they want, a part, they want us strategically, and we are. AUKUS is an example of that. The Seventh Fleet is an example of that. But I'm, I don't mean to get on a high horse about this. But economics, uh, an international economic statecraft, is part of America and it's part of our strategic vision. And we have to work through the issues both to our domestic politics, but also our international economic interests and strategic interests. And we have it. And we're shortchanging ourselves because not all of America is on the field. Wow. Have you ever thought of running for office? Uh, it's a really, well, I'll tell you this, this young woman, I mean, I've always thought about this. I wrote about, about I, I, I'm a firm believer. Back in 2005, when I wrote a book, I talked about national service, and we should, I, I really, really do believe in it, and for a whole host of domestic reasons, let alone international. But I do think this is, it's I, going to see these young men and women I run with them. I've gone on the ships with them, taken the prime minister. I've taken the foreign minister. They're doing everything we asked them to do when they said, signed up and took an oath. But not all of us are doing it. And if we're going to win, we don't get to only kind of participate at 45% of our strength level. That's my view. Well, hear, hear. I'm, uh, I hear you loud and clear. I agree with you entirely. We unfortunately lost a block of time. Um, on what? I'm joking. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I do want to, I, I, I'll, at the end, I do want to address it because it's a very fair issue. It's an important yeah. issue. That's not how I would have done it, but it's a very fair question. So get to but your other question. You do, yeah. I mean, we've, we've glancingly touched on China. And I wanted to directly go on to it. So I, no, no. I, what I'm saying is in this conversation, yeah. China has come up sort of obliquely <laughs> I, you're not you're not the ambassador to China. This isn't a program about China, but I'm curious what you see as Japan's view and relationship towards China, because like the rest of the world, uh, which wants to sort of have it both ways, want to have the benefit of uh, trade, economics, et cetera, uh, with China, but still uh, particularly given the geography, wanting to hold China at arm's length and not wanting to be subject to coercion. That sort of hedging is common in Asia, particularly. Is that what you see? And how, does, how do you see Japan sort of reconciling the security threats with the economic interests in that complicated relationship? 
Well, I mean, you're asking me on the day after, it's not even 24 hours, they've arrested a senior executive of a Japanese pharmaceutical company. You're asking me in this period of time where China is fishing in Japan's waters based on the public health of Fukushima water, yet refusing to import the same fish that Japan catches in their own EEZ. So it's a very, I mean, they have, a, they, like all of us, like our companies, had 30 years based on investments, and they now got to realize that's not a safe investment. And they, so they're very, they are leery of China. Uh, and I think they would be better for Japan to speak about Japan's feelings. They are a neighbor, they're a neighbor in the region, but they are also leery of the way China acts economically and how they uh, act in their economic interest. And so they've got their guard up. It's that kind of straightforward. Um, and it's not the, what it was 20 years ago or 15 years ago, because China clearly has changed under uh, President Xi. It's a different country. Um, and so Japan's making, and we are doing the same thing. We're making adjustments because this is not the China of 20 years ago that was a part of the global system. Well, unfortunately, we've gone into overtime and we didn't have the opportunity to invite people to ask uh, questions. Sorry about but, that. Um, if As you... Henry Kessinger used to say, does anybody have questions for my answers? Right. Uh, <laughs> so you... like, here's, my, here's my thing and just, when the president signed the infrastructure bill, there was a guarantee for certain energy projects in Alaska. But my thing is, and that's part of it, and so it's $20 billion loan guarantees for the particular project in Alaska. That's one. Two, in Japan, Russia is 10% of their LNG. And second, in the region, 42% of the re energy in the region is produced by coal. So if you want to get coal out of the system, like we've done in our country, and reduce it, you're going to have to have a, a portfolio of resources, SMR, nuclear, wind, solar, et cetera, and also uh, cleaner LNG that's part of that, and not Russian-based, because they're not going to Europe. It's not a permanent piece. It's a transitional energy. and it's signed into law, so it's better that something come from the United States than it does come from Russia to our number one ally. And I don't think we want to see with Russia turned off from Europe that they're given the opportunity to get a footprint in the Indo-Pacific. Let alone, though, it's a part of a portfolio, as is hydrogen, as is batteries, as in that every, every other issue. And there is a legitimate concern that countries are we need to speed up the country's transition and not let them get caught in making an investment that ties them into a slower pace in that transition to cleaner sources. That's totally legit, and I respect the fact that people are passionate about it. I don't respect kind of interrupting when we're trying to have a good conversation. Other people got through the rain to get here. That said, there's a, this is a challenge. We're all trying to do, as a former mayor who shut down two coal plants in his city, I care deeply about this, but we're trying to do it in a responsible way that allows the countries of the region to both grow economically, but also become closer to the United States, shut Russia out, and then tap all the resources to make the transition the same way the United States has. We reduce coal because of our energy capacity. Those countries want to follow that model. Awesome. Well, Ram, I think that our country is lucky to have you in Japan, and I think the Japanese are lucky to have you representing us. Well, thank you. I do want to say to everybody that A, went through this, but also more importantly, it came through the rain. That shows a real interest in uh, the country and our mission. I want to thank you for making it here. Thanks for having me. Please, thank you.